Good evening. My name is Rhonda Craig, president of the League of Women Voters Detroit. Tonight's forum is a joint production of the League of Women Voters Detroit, the League of Women Voters Macomb County, and the League of Women Voters Gross Point. We will be presenting candidates to represent the 11th district of the Michigan House, which covers Harper Woods, St. Clair Shores, and a part of Detroit. This event is being recorded and will be available to be re to viewed to be available to be viewed on the Detroit League's website and YouTube, the Macomb League's YouTube, Facebook, and website, and the Gross Point League's YouTube, Facebook, and website. The League of Women Voters is providing this forum as an opportunity for candidates to express their views related to their candidacy. Statements expressed by the candidates are neither endorsed or opposed by the League of Women Voters. Also, the League does not certify any candidate responses to questions as accurate. Voters are encouraged to fact check information shared at the forum. I am pleased to welcome the candidates for the Michigan House of Representatives 11th District. All candidates were invited to participate. We have eight candidates for the Michigan House 11th District present for tonight's forum. Patrick Bianj, Marvin Cotton, Paul Francis, Alex Manuel, Veronica Pais, Athena Lynn Thornton, Ricardo White, and Regina Williams. Questions from the public have been garnered from all three league's websites and Facebook pages, in addition to local newspapers and from tonight's league participants. League members have sorted the questions and have eliminated irrelevant, redundant, and slanderous questions. We would like to introduce the following Gross Point League members who are serving in the following roles. We have our moderator, Sue Acton, who is president of the League of Women Voters Gross Point. Our timekeeper is Julian Phillips. She is also with Gross Point League of Women Voters. We have a Zoom tech team, which includes Vicki Granger and Lori Kingsbury. The League of Women Voters is a national organization whose mission is to promote political responsibility through informed and active participation of citizens in government. The League neither endorses nor opposes candidates or political parties. We welcome those age 16 or older to join our membership. Our moderator, Sue Acton, president of the League of Women Voters Gross Point, will outline the format for the evening and lead tonight's forum. Sue? Thank you, Rhonda, and good evening. The format for this forum has been established by the League of Women Voters of Gross Point, and the format was received and reviewed by all candidates prior to the forum. Each candidate will have the opportunity to make an opening statement not to exceed two minutes, and the order in which they speak has been determined by drawing lots just prior to the forum. The timer will hold up a card to indicate 30 seconds remaining, and a card indicating stop when time has expired. When the time is up, the candidate may finish speaking only that sentence they were on. Following their opening statements, the candidates will be answering written questions submitted by the public and by league members. Candidates may not make personal attacks on other candidates. Such attempts will be cut short. And as moderator, I am in charge of the forum at all times and reserve the right to close discussion on a question. As moderator, I will then ask a series of questions. Each candidate will have up to one minute to respond. After five candidates have answered the first question, I will ask a new question to be answered by the next five candidates. Now that means not all candidates will answer every question. So the last question I will ask will be, choose a question you were not asked and give us your answer. Each candidate will then have two minutes for a closing statement. 
which will be conducted in reverse order of the opening statements. Without further ado, we will now begin with the candidate's opening statement. And again, each candidate will have two minutes. Mr. Cotton, you will go first. Thank you for having me here. I'm very honored to be um, amongst this August body of uh, Democrats. My name is Marvin Cotton Jr. and I am a motivational speaker and a community organizer. Um, I decided to run for office because quite frankly, I got tired of going to legislators um, weekly, sometimes daily asking to get the right thing, get them to do the right thing. Um, so I figured I'd go to Lansing and do it myself. I spent 19 years, seven months and 12 days in prison for a crime that I didn't commit. Um, I was exonerated October 1st, 2020. Um, since my release, I've been community organizing and helping out in every way that I can. I've come to the table um, with almost every branch of law enforcement um, to give my advice and um, to help with training so that what happened to me doesn't happen to another innocent person. Um, you know, my passion for helping people, like I said, has taken me to many legislators, um, both Democrat and Republicans, and they love to hear my story. They love to take pictures with me. But when it comes time to do the right thing, they don't want to move. So instead of begging or pleading and becoming frustrated with things not getting done, um, I want to take the 90,000 voices in District 11 um, and take it, to, um, take it to Lansing and really get some things done and hopefully be able to reach um, across the aisle and um, make some substantial changes. Thank you. Ms. Williams, your opening statement. Good evening, everyone. My name is Regina L. Williams and I'm running for state representative in District 11, which includes Harbor Woods, St. Clair Shores and east side of Detroit. First, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for inviting me to speak today. I'm running for office because I believe a new voice of change is needed in the Michigan House. One that truly represents the people of this district and is a servant to the public. I've served my community as a city council member for the city of Harper Woods for the past three years. Before that, I served for almost seven years on the Harper Woods Board of Education as the first African-American elected as president. I am an experienced and dedicated leader. I'm a 26 year career educator working in Detroit and I'm a former military first lieutenant MP officer who proudly served. I obtained both my bachelor's and master's degrees from Wayne State University. I've taken several doctoral classes in educational leadership. I'm a member of several organizations to include the Michigan Municipal League, DFT, AFT, DACTM, National Science Teachers Association, and the OES. I grew up on the east side of Detroit, and I know what it's like to come from a low socioeconomic area and the many challenges that people face in their everyday lives. After college, I became a teacher, and I believe so strongly in serving and giving back to my community that I ran for and was elected to the Harper Woods Board of Education and from there, the city council. If I'm elected, I will be that strong voice for the people at the state level. I'm a strong advocate for reforms in education that best supports student achievement. I will support policies to improve the economy, produce more job training, advocate for women reproductive rights, and secure funding for local communities to help make positive changes. I believe a change is needed and that change is me. I'm a strong proven leader, hardworking, trusted, and lead with integrity. That's why I, Regina Williams, I'm running for state representative and believe that I am the best choice to represent District 11. Thank you. Thank you. When we started this forum, Mr. Bianch was present and um, drew lots for slot three. Since then, he's had technical difficulties. If he should return in the near future, we will slot him back in. However, at this time, we will move on. Mr. Francis, your opening statement. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Paul Francis. First of all, um, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for setting tonight up. I'd also like to thank you for all your work do, you do protecting and expanding voting rights and specifically uh, your work on eliminating gerrymandering and taking money out of politics. I was born on the east side of Detroit into a large extended Italian American family. Like uh, many other working class families, we had our shares of up and downs. I was the first person in my immediate family to earn a college diploma. <clears throat> I am thankful that my education prepared for me for a successful career in sales management as well. I even established my own small business. 
I'm grateful for all the opportunities I've had. Also, all the opportunities my extended family has had. Many accomplishments I've seen. Uh, we have two female doctors. Uh, we actually have a rocket scientist, several teachers, and many, many more. Like many um, working class families we faced are adversities. I've seen people struggle with uh, I've seen people struggle with health issues, addiction, loss of health care benefits, crippling student loan debt, and poverty. The reason I'm running, state government cannot remove all the obstacles that Michigan residents face, but it should work in their best interest. We must break the special interest hold on our democracy and our state uh, legislator so that the government works for the people, not the other way around. So I look forward to getting your vote in representing District 11. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pies, your opening statement. Ms. Pies, you are on mute. Can we um, begin again? Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, my name is Veronica Pies. I'm a 20 plus year resident of Harper Woods. I grew up in Macomb County in uh, Warren and later in um, Clinton Township. When I went to college, uh, I lived in Cass Corridor and then later moved into uh, East English Village area of Detroit over on uh, Chandler Park and Chalmers area and later in Corville and Mack area. I've been on uh, Harper Woods City Council since 2015. I was appointed then and later elected that year, reelected in 2019. I am currently a executive board member of the Michigan Hispanic, Michigan Democratic Party Hispanic Latino Caucus. I'm a Mexican American background. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, Michigan Municipal League. I'm on their legislative committees for elections and for municipal services. Prior to council, I was on the uh, city's um, library board and parks and rec board. I've, um, I've been really privileged uh, over these past few years as a council member to be able to speak with the residents here, uh, to be able to hear what their concerns are, um, to be able to answer those concerns or at the least um, find out what they need to know and we can discuss that. I feel that I've been uh, well respected here. I feel also that I, I know also that uh, we're a very diverse district. Um, Detroit has some commonalities with St. Clair Shores. We're all together. I feel that my background of having been raised on public assistance, uh, having gone to college, having lived in Detroit and Macomb County, uh, having the council experience has uh, afforded me to diverse background to represent a diversity of this. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Pais. Thank you. Mr. White, your opening statement. Uh, good evening and thank you to the league for hosting us this evening. Uh, it's exciting to talk about uh, this race for the 11th district. Um, I'm a former legislative staffer uh, in Lansing. I used to work for the House of Representatives and for the governor of the state of Michigan, Governor Whitmer as a public affairs specialist. Uh, and throughout each opportunity, uh, I've worked uh, to advance the issues that are affecting uh, our community. Um, I think that it is important that we have someone who's elected to office who has the relationships and understanding of how policy works, uh, who has the experience of being in Lansing and working at the highest levels of our government to tackle things like education and economic development and workforce development uh, and growing our state's population. We have an aging population in, in Michigan uh, and we really have to do put forward the policies uh, that are gonna benefit all citizens uh, and make this state grow. Um, I think that that's why many unions and community leaders uh, have endorsed my candidacy for state representative because they understand uh, the importance of having someone like me uh, elected to office. Uh, government is a service industry. Uh, when, when you get elected to these positions, you're going there to serve uh, the public, not to enrich yourself uh, and not to grab headlines, so to say. Uh, so I want to get to work and simply put, I'm ready on day one to get up there to Lansing and advance the policies that are gonna grow this state and our economy uh, and help our students and help our communities grow. Uh, so again, I'm thankful. I look forward to the conversation tonight 
uh, and just looking forward to answering some questions. So thank you again. Thank you. Ms. Thornton, your opening statement. Ms. Thornton, you're muted. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Athena Lynn Thornton. I am a mother, a proud public servant, an entrepreneur, a graduate of the Detroit public school system. I am a lifetime union member. Having worked for the public service, uh, right now I work with the Department of the Attorney General and I have worked for Third Circuit Court in the criminal justice system for over 30 years. That is what brought me here today. I believe that we should have criminal justice reform, not only for adults, but also for juveniles. I serve, I believe in service and solutions. As a union member, I have fought for our union members to get increased wages for them to continue the benefits that they have. Having been a mother and a single mother, I've also had to um, borrow money from uh, lending resources. And I believe that we should have fair lending practices amongst everyone in all financial institutions. I love uh, being a resident here. Back in 2021, I was one of the many residents in Detroit and Harper Woods and St. Clair Shores who uh, suffered um, with the heavy rainfall and the flooding. So that is one of the reasons that I also began this race. I believe that I am a new leadership. I haven't um, served on a lot of boards, but I am a fighter. I believe in our people. I believe that we should have, uh, having been raised and grown up in Detroit and gone to the public school system, I believe that every child has a right to a good educational system. So thank I you, Ms. Thornton. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manuel, your, your opening statement. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Uh, just a quick note as I'm going last, I, I appreciate seeing all the fellow candidates and so it's good to see everybody uh this is a grind so kudos to us um so working from home during the pandemic gave me an opportunity to fulfill what was a childhood dream and it was fixing up an old house in detroit uh so in the fall of 2020 i did just that i moved into a all brick tudor home in east english village on the east side of detroit uh, i spent basically the following year fixing up the house and working from home and things felt good uh, as Ms. Thornton just mentioned, then last year there was a flood on the east side of Detroit. And overnight, the excitement I felt for my new neighborhood changed to concern. Uh, it was declared a federal disaster. Uh, and so I, the next couple of days, I'm hauling garbage out to the curb and my neighbor says to me, what are we gonna do? What can we do? Nothing. And he really believed that. Uh, and I thought about that for a while, and I think we can do something, and I think I'm uniquely suited to lead on this issue. Uh, unlike any of the 148 members of the legislature that turn over every six years, my background is in civil engineering and infrastructure finance. I've worked for the Michigan DOT overseeing the construction of roads and bridges, including water systems that go underneath the roads. Uh, I've worked for engineering firms cleaning up rivers and polluted brownfields. I've worked um, as an entrepreneur, I started a business called Hostel Detroit in North Corktown. Uh, and for the last 10 years, I've been an infrastructure finance consultant. I help companies build things like solar farms, wind farms, uh, infrastructure assets like that. And so when this flood happened, I looked at what, what we needed to do, and it is a complicated, expensive problem. And like Mr. Cotton said, I don't think the legislature gets anything done and I'm ready to go do it myself. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We will turn now to our questions and these did come from the public and some from some league members and we'll get to as many as we can. It's looking like about eight different questions. And then of course the ninth question will be something you were not asked. 
because we're going to ask this five in a row. All right. The first two questions are on your district and your platform. We do have a newly formed district thanks to the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. Can you describe Michigan's new 11th State House District for us and explain how your platform will address the needs of the people in this district? Ms. Williams, you will Thank be you. first. Thank you. Um, our new district now um, includes uh, Harper Woods, St. Clair Shores, and parts of the east side of Detroit. So it kind of cuts along uh, the freeway along Harper Avenue and also cuts along Kelly uh, in Detroit. And so that is this East English Village area and then just a little bit further beyond and then it's a, going a little bit over towards Chalmers, but it's, it's pretty much along I-94 is where it's, the boundaries are. Um, it used to be, it used to be include Gross Point. So that's been cut off now. Um, that particular area, I grew up on the east side. I grew up over there that, that the area contains and my mother lives there. Um, so I'm very familiar with the area and I'm, I'm very familiar with the people there and also in Harper Woods and in St. Clair Shores. So I plan to do everything I can to support this community to support all three communities and do what I can for this district. Um, Thank you. That's my stop. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Francis, can you describe this new district and explain how your platform will address the needs of its people? Yes, the district goes from East, Eng uh, East English Village in Detroit all the way up to St. Clair Shores where I live um, and includes Harper Woods. It's a diverse uh, community of the East Side but we all have some of the same basic issues that have not been addressed uh, over the last decade or longer. And my platform is based on things that are going to help people out in their day-to-day -day life. Raise the minimum wage. One job should be enough. If you're working 40 hours a week, you should have enough money to support yourself. Uh, the right to women's health care, the right to uh, an abortion, also support uh, skilled trades, common sense gun laws, um, work to fix our sewer systems, as it has been mentioned before, and repeal the tax on senior pensions. I think for too long, special interest has dominated our politics. We need to get people that are working for the people and get money out of politics and get it back to what the people need. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pies, same question. Thank you. Our district has changed in that we now have a, uh, we go from a, a deeply urban district to a deeply suburban district. Uh, we have different but similar concerns, uh, housing concerns across the board. We have uh, water infrastructure concerns for differing reasons um, from Detroit uh, infrastructure, um, to St. Clair Shores, also infrastructure, but also more shoreline. And um, we've got about 53% uh, black population, or I'm sorry, white population and 44% white population. So um, those statistics have changed a little bit also. So I plan to address uh, clean water, public health and housing. Thank you. Mr. White. Same question, describe your district and explain how your platform will address the needs of the people. Sure, so the three communities of Detroit, Harper Woods and St. Clair Shores, um, the demographics are the same, but the issues, I'm sorry, the, the demographics are different, but the issues are the same. Uh, people care about education. They care about where their next paycheck is gonna come from. They care about uh, their security, uh, especially in the time with rising costs of goods and services. And that's why I've introduced the Main Street Michigan plan, which is going to tackle that. Uh, we've got to make sure that state policy is working at every level with individuals who are elected at the local level, uh, at the county level, at the federal level, uh, to really tackle the issues that are affecting uh, individuals at their kitchen table. I mean, when people go to bed at night and wake up in the morning, they don't think about if their representative is a Democrat or Republican, they care about the issues that are impacting them at home. Uh, and again, I think that's why so many individuals and groups have gotten behind me because they have seen my plan. They've had these conversations with me and they understand that I'm the one to do the job. Uh, and I mean, just today, you know, we saw on Friday the 
uh, revoking of a right that had been uh, afforded to women for 49 years in this country. Thank you. Thank you. And we will get to that. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Thornton, uh, can you describe your new district and explain how your platform will address the needs for the people? The district is very diverse, as many of my colleagues and the candidates have said. Um, right now, it is considered more Caucasian. I believe it's maybe 51% white and 49% black. Even though the demographics are different, also what's different are, are some of the needs. I've spoken with business owners in Harper Woods and St. Clair Shores. I just spoke with business owners today also in Detroit. And one of the concerns is public safety for the businesses in Detroit. The concerns that I've spoken with the people in Harper Woods and St. Clair Shores, they have a little bit of different concerns. It might not be safety, but they want more funding. So even though we are in one district, some of the needs are different. Some of the needs are different, and but the infrastructure, the needs of infrastructure and okay. public safety. Thank you. They, Thank you. They run different. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, here All right. I go. Question two. And for this question, we will begin with Mr. Manuel. What made you interested in running for this office? What in your background do you believe has prepared you for this position? And what are your two, top two priorities? Okay. Uh, what made me interested in running for this office? This was never in my trajectory, so to speak. This was uh, this flood. This federal disaster flood got me off the couch to do this. And as I've dove deeper and deeper into the process of campaigning and meeting thousands of people knocking doors, uh, the, the people in this district are having a hard time. And as this has been mentioned, costs are going up. Uh, and so I figured I can do something about something, infrastructure. How do I feel prepared? My background is in civil engineering. Uh, it's in finance. How do I feel prepared to be a politician having never run? My father was a politician. He was chair of the local party where I grew up. I grew up around politics. I largely stayed away from it in my adulthood until four months ago when I decided to do this. Thank you. But All I'm right. ready. <laughs> Mr. Cotton, same questions. What made you interested? What in your background has prepared you? And what are your two, top two priorities? Um, you know, as I said in my introduction, I was wrongfully convicted. I did nearly 20 years in prison. Um, you know, being wronged by a system that is flawed um, is what really motivates me to, to get involved uh, really at every level. Um, you know, uh, our government, I'm, I'm living, breathing proof that there's issues with our government, but I'm also living proof that um, the government can get it right. It was the Conviction Integrity Unit that you know, got me out of prison, which is a part of the prosecutor's office. Um, I don't spend a lot of time seeking um, endorsements or groups to, you know, support me because I don't want groups or, or to, to try to control me when I'm in office. I want to get in there and actually get the job done. Um, I really want to carry the voice of the people with me um, and fight for it. So that's what I'm about. Um, I don't bend, I don't break. Um, and I I'm not influenced by anybody, but what is right. They are they black, white, Latino? I'm going to fight for them, period. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Williams, why are you, what made you interested? What in your background has prepared you and what are your priorities? Okay, you said Ms. Williams? Yes. Okay. Um, what made me interested in running for state representative is that uh, when I ran for um, the uh, Harper School Board and also as a city council member, I realized there's so much that still need to be done. And at the state level, there's so much more that could, that could be accomplished um, for a larger community than just the city of Harper Woods, because we're looking at Harper Woods, St. Clair Shores, and the east side of Detroit. So there's so much more that could be accomplished on that level. Um, my background experience of being on Harperwood School Board and as City Council prepared me to be a state rep. Uh, one of my number one priorities is always going to be education because I am a teacher and I believe in children and I believe in doing what's best 
to uh, support students and trying to make education more equitable. Um, another one is also um, um, helping the economy because our prices that we're paying so for gas and for food is just so high. So doing something about that, there's gotta be something that, that must be changed. Thank you, thank you, Ms. So Bruce. those are my top two priorities. Thank you. thank you. Mr. Francis, same question. Uh, well, I've always been interested in politics. I've helped uh, other candidates run for office before. And I've seen in my lifetime from the 90s to now how the government has pulled back from assisting people and trying to just live their everyday life, how they uh, cut funding for colleges, how they cut funding for schools, how they haven't responded to the needs that are out there um, when it comes to common sense gun control, how they haven't raised the minimum wage. All these issues are things that we could fix. I think a lot of people out there get discouraged that the government is not working for them. They're working harder and harder every day to get less and less. I am an optimist by nature. These things can be fixed. We do not have to live this way. We need a government that understands these problems are fixable. They understand that Michigan is one of the greatest states in the union, and we do not have, have to accept this. So that's my main reasons for running is to make a better state. Thank you. Ms. Pai, same question. Um, my reason is for running and also at the same time what's pre prepared me for this is that I, I've seen through talking with residents here for years and from years of volunteer work, I've uh, become more acutely aware of how our legislation is uh, affecting the equity across the board. I see this also as, as a member of the um, Hispanic Latino Caucus. I see that statewide in underserved communities. Um, I've really seen a need for equity. And I think that um, that's also a main motivator of mine. Um, so it's really the volunteer work that I've done over the years, uh, which includes city council, um, speaking with people for years, uh, seeing equity and seeing what happens at the state legislature and uh, intimately knowing how that's affected uh, residents here and, and more broadly. And uh, that's my interest for running. Uh, that's what's prepared me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, as we turn to question three, the community has some interest in some current issues. So that's where we will start with Mr. White. Gun safety is a pressing topic. If elected, what changes in Michigan's laws would you propose and vote for? So actually I would uh, reintroduce the bills that were introduced in 2016 uh, by my former boss, who's now Oakland County Treasurer Robert Wittenberg. Uh, he introduced red flag laws in the state of Michigan and an assault weapons ban. Uh, and I had the privilege of working on that legislation then, and this was you know, many years ago when there were still mass shootings going on all across the country. Uh, and we've done nothing, nothing. Uh, the one good thing that we saw recently was the federal red flag law that was introduced and passed and signed by the president, but we need an assault weapons ban. I mean, it's proven to work. We had it from 1993 to 2004. Uh, and if the federal legislature won't take action, I'll take action. So I plan on introducing uh, those pieces of legislation here in Michigan uh, and working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, uh, because this should be a nonpartisan issue, but unfortunately it's not. Uh, and getting that passed and signed into law by the governor uh, and protecting our families, protecting uh, kids at school uh, and protecting our communities, because it's much, it's desperately needed. Thank you. Ms. Thornton, same question. I would uh, second what uh, Mr. Uh, White said. I definitely believe that we should have an assault weapons ban. Um, I believe that our children are entitled to uh, be safe when they're walking down the street and going to school. I believe that we should have absolute safety, that children should not fear going to school. I believe that um, the weapons ban and also uh, gun control. I should, I believe that there should be background checks also, more thorough background checks on people who would like to buy and purchase guns. That should definitely be looked at 
having been a part of the criminal justice system, um, that is one thing that's easily fixable. And I believe that I can add uh, and make a difference in our legislature. Thank you. Mr. Manuel. Thank you. Uh, you know, the main points have been mentioned, uh, ban high, or excuse me, ban assault rifles. The only thing I haven't heard yet is high capacity magazines included in this list. You know, these are obvious things to most people, but it seems like there's just gridlock all the time. I had the privilege of sitting next to Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence at an event uh, a few weeks ago. And I asked her, if, if nothing can get done on this, we talked about this specifically, if nothing can get done federally, on guns, what could we do? What in, I asked her, and what in my capacity as state rep should I, be, should I be trying to do? And without hesitation, she said school hardening, a concept I hadn't heard of, uh, but it's pretty simple. It's basically putting one entrance at public schools with a metal detector. And it's a depressing discussion to have, but uh, if we're talking about keeping children safe, and if we can't move on gun legislation at the state level, we could move on hardening our schools. Thank you. Mr. Cotton, same question. Uh, if elected, what changes in Michigan laws would you propose and vote for on gun safety? Um, um, one of the things that I would like to see and like to work on is um, the government really taking a look at um, nonprofits, ways to shore up nonprofits to be able to come into places like schools and give teachers um, extra assistance. You know, uh, students need mental health um, treatment as well. And I believe that was screen out a lot of, um, you know, I don't want to say problem children, but children that need um, that special attention. Um, but adults need that special attention as well. And I believe that nonprofits being able to go into the workplace or be able to receive grant money to go into the workplace as well as school environment um, can help um, public safety and give us all what we need. Um, so I really think we need to really take a look at that as well as um, um, empowering nonprofits and organizations with funding uh, to go into the streets and make the streets a safer place because law enforcement can't do it all by themselves. Thank you. And Ms. Williams. Thank you. Um, I think uh, one of the things about gun safety is, um, one, I think the body armor should be, um, people should be banned from buying body armor. Um, I, I really see no reason why the normal person would be walking around with body armor unless they're intent on doing something. Um, you know, police officers have it and, and people who are, 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 are uh, trying to defend, uh, but there's no real reason why people should have body armor. The other reason, thing that I think should uh, occur is that um, parents should be held accountable for their child or people who have guns or go around shooting people. Um, there should be mandatory gun locks, you know, especially if you have small children. But parents definitely should be held accountable. If your child go out and, and do something harmful um, with a weapon, I believe the parents should be held accountable. If you hold these parents accountable, some of it wouldn't happen. And also the mental health is a, is a serious part of it. So better mental health screening. Thank you. All right, our fourth question um, is coming up and we will start with Mr. Francis for this one. Roe v. Wade has been overturned by the Supreme Court, even as Michigan must deal with anti-abortion legislation on its books dating back 90 years. What is your position on reproductive rights in Michigan, and what will you do to make those views a reality? First of all, uh, we need to make sure that the, the law that's currently on the books does not get enforced or working on that. We need to enshrine in law a woman's right to a reproductive health and to abortion. We need to make sure there's no laws out there that gives a 24 hour waiting period at all. These laws are designed to basically take the control away from a woman and her doctor and move it to the state. Uh, the key thing is to introduce a law that enshrines these rights 70% of the people in the United States, 70% of America does not think the government should be involved with healthcare. 
this is a no-brainer. This has only been overturned due to special interest of a minor minority of people. So I am strongly pro-choice. I am strongly for women's right to choose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Francis. Ms. Pye, same question. I believe completely in um, reproductive freedom and, and uh, beyond that, and a person's uh, ownership of his or her own body. Regarding uh, Roe v. Wade being overturned, I was saddened by that. I think our legislature needs to take a good hard look at uh, the current uh, 1931 law, which I believe is a constitutional amendment. So we need to either amend that or repeal it. However, uh, for all that we can do in the legislature, I think the bottom line comes down to our Supreme Court choices. So um, taking a little side here, I would ask everybody to be sure about who they vote for for Supreme Court, because as legislators, we can go in and try all we want. But the bottom line for us is that someone's going to take it to court and we need to have somebody there working for us, especially. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Same question. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm pro-choice. Uh, I believe that a woman should have uh, the right to make decisions for her own body uh, with the consultation of her doctor. Um, and I think that that's why Planned Parenthood endorsed me today. Um, I also think that this is a broader fight around rights. Justice Thomas mentioned three other cases that could upend the civil rights of many in this country, including myself. Uh, you know, I'm married. Uh, my husband and I are married, uh, but Michigan still has a 2004 constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage here. So overnight, uh, my marriage could become dissolved. Uh, so this is a broader fight, and that's why after August, I am fully committed to helping Democrats uh, pick up the House majority uh, because it doesn't stop with winning this primary. We have to win enough seats in November as well to make sure we overturn uh, the laws and prevent any other laws from banning a woman's right to choose in this state. Uh, so I support. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Same question, sorry. I strongly support a woman's right to choose and uh, reproductive freedom. I believe that uh, not only should we work in the legislature, but we should also make sure that people are voting. People who say that they are upset because of Roe v. Wade, we have to make sure that those same people go to the polls. We have to make sure that they vote, that they don't let it slide because they um, are um, not uh, enthusiastic over the current democratic system. I believe that we should also make sure that not only our legislature, but those who we vote for, also the Supreme Court, they have a very uh, great part to play in what's going to happen in our future. And if we start by making sure that people go out to vote, that uh, no one sleeps, that no one rests, that they get out and that they vote, Thank we you. can no return. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Manuel, same question. Yes, thank you. Uh, very much pro-choice. My mother taught me very young that life is not binary. It's never as simple as right and wrong or black and white. Life happens in the gray area. And that was the lesson I took home on abortion. Uh, I also was endorsed by Planned Parenthood of Michigan today. In addition to Veronica, I don't know if you even saw it, you didn't mention it. Uh, they endorsed three candidates. Uh, two things that weren't mentioned. I think the state legislature could take immediate action on uh, birth control and emergency contraception, contraception availability outside of the repeal of Roe v. Wade. I think that's something that should be done tomorrow, uh, if not already. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry to the women in my life this week. It's, it's been a hard week, but I am ready to go fight toe to toe with these people uh, for whatever right they're coming for next after reproductive health. Thank you. Now we had questions as we turn to question five, we had questions from the public on many social issues, such as school funding and curriculum, racial, racial justice, LGBTQ, mental health, the opioid crisis. We also 
had questions on inflation and the economic concerns of residents. So, social or economic, on which issues do you plan to focus the legislation you will introduce? We begin with Mr. Catton. Um, economics really influence, um, you know, every area of life, um, um, especially social. Um, anytime that a community is devastated and there's not enough jobs or good paying jobs, um, it has a social effect on the community. It has, a, it has an effect on crime. It has an effect on the students and, you know, students going to school hungry and not having the ability to have all the things they have, it affects their concentration. So anytime that economics is a problem, social, the social arena is gonna be a problem as well. So you can't address one without addressing the other. But I believe the key is the economic um, 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 solution because it, you know, when you focus economically, you can create social plans from that because you know, anybody that's working in the social, the social workers, um, arena, they need money, they need funding, they need to be able to make things happen so that people can live a better social life because that's all we want. We want to be happy, we want to have peace, and we and we want to really be able to live our lives the way we want to. Thank you very much. Ms. Williams, social or economic, on which issues do you plan to focus the legislation you will introduce? Okay, uh, thank you for asking. Um, I think that was a really tough question at first because social issues, I mean, I, I am an African-American woman. Um, I'm married to an African-American African -American man and, you know, we've had issues because of our race. And so, you know, it's, it's really challenging sometimes just because of who we are. However, the economy is something that's affecting everybody right now. You know, paying $5, to get, uh, to $5 for gas, um, all the high prices in the grocery stores. So I think right now, immediately, we need some changes with the economy. We got to do something to help the people. We got to do something to, to bring those prices down. The price of oil is super high. Um, so there's got to be something that could be done to actually that help the economy and help everybody right now at this moment. And then after that, I would definitely tackle the social issues. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Mr. Francis, same question. Well, honestly, I don't think it's, I mean, need economics, need social issues. I think the two run hand in hand. You, it doesn't do you any good to have economic issues, issues unless you have social justice. So I think you need to approach it uh, that you can achieve both of them at the same time. That's what I honestly believe. It is true we're having an economic crisis in the making right now because of inflation. I think that's the key focus is to start with economics, but when you're making economic policy, you need to make sure it's inclusive, includes everyone with it. So I think it needs to be addressed both at the same time and not separately. Um, we can do this. You can look over to other countries in Europe where they run these policies at the same time and it brings everybody up. Thank you, Ms. Pies. Same question, social or economic, on which issues will you plan to focus the legislation you will introduce? Social and economic are, are hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Um, I think my main priority, uh, since we're working with over 110 colleagues in the House, would be to make sure that any legislation put forth has a, is based on equity. Uh, so from there, I would take it to um, some court reform. I think that there's a criminalization of poverty that's been ongoing. Uh, we need to change the uh, court and sentencing reform for that. I think we also need to pay attention to our zoning laws, which affect uh, public health. Uh, so I think there's, there's quite a number of uh, ways that they can both be intertwined, if you will. But overall, it's equitable. It's equitable legislation at its base. Thank you. Mr. White, same question. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that that's what you'll find in this primary field. We all typically agree on what the issues are. It's just how to address them. Uh, I think that they go hand in hand. I mean, you cannot, I mean, especially as we continue to recover from COVID-19, uh, investing in our economy, making sure that people have access to jobs and job training as uh, careers change. Uh, and people need new opportunities, but also on the social side, uh, especially as we're seeing these Supreme Court cases come down 
uh, and being clued in on what their moves are next. Uh, so we have to expand the Elliott Larson here. We have to invest in our economy to build it up for the next generation uh, and attract and retain workers here. Uh, but you have to do both at the same time. And that's why I introduced the Main Street Michigan plan to really do both things at once and really give people a sense of government working for them uh, once again. Thank you. All right, we are going to now move on to some infrastructure questions. And this one will go to Ms. Thornton first. Improvements to infrastructure in this district and in our state have long been ignored. Is there a regional solution to our infrastructure needs? And if so, what would that be? I definitely believe that there is a regional um, solution to infrastructure, uh, our infrastructure needs. One very simple solution is that I also did go for some training for engineering. And one very simple solution is just planting more trees. They said if we plant more trees in certain areas that can decrease the flooding by almost up to 25%. So first I would like to start there. Uh, then we could work with the Detroit water and sewer system and try to um, see if those systems can not be combined. If there's some way for those systems not to be combined or improved upon or updated, then we can work on that next. But the very easy solution is planting more trees in some of our areas to um, decrease the flooding. Mr. Manuel. Thank you. I looked at the problem of infrastructure underfunding as the challenge of what I will try to accomplish as state rep. And I looked at who uses the most water in the state of Michigan? And the answer to that question are Consumers Energy and DTE, publicly traded companies that own the infrastructure that controls the lives of everyone in Southeast Michigan, essentially, with the exception of one, Wyandotte. Wyandotte uses public power. The city of Wyandotte has control over their billing and their energy production. I'm campaigning on a platform of public power. DTE should not be a business. They make a billion dollars a year, they're water hogs, and they give most of that profit back to shareholders as dividends. If elected, I will work at Leading Michigan towards public, specifically Southeast Michigan, where DTE has aggregated a ton of power and influence over the state legislature. I will try to push for public power. And there are interim steps that we can also get to as well, but that's where I'm Thank going. You. Thank you very much. Mr. Cotton, same question. Well, I believe the government should keep their hands off a of women body and put their hands on this issue right here. I believe people should be baptized in church and not in their own basements. Um, so we have a real problem. <clears throat> we have a real problem. Um, 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 I believe that a strong legislator would know how to step away from Lansing for just a second and get with all of the leaders. involved and see if we can work on um, companies to do something. But that's an option to be able to pass legislation that will hold companies responsible for um, um, better upkeep. But I also believe the city of Detroit and the city of Harper Woods and the city of St. Clair Shores um, should share in that. Um, I don't believe companies should carry all of the weight themselves considering that it's the people, um, the public that benefits the most from having good systems. Um, not only with the infrastructure dealing with water, but we also have the infrastructure dealing with roads. And um, when we set when we when we set things up, um, fixing on the roads, companies, um, uh, company, those little small businesses are are affected Thank because you. of the construction. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Ms. Williams, is there a regional solution to our infrastructure needs? And if so, what would it be? Uh, yes, I think there is a solution to our infrastructure needs. Um, one, of, one of them is to increase the funding and, you may, and the government may have to look at different avenues to look at how they're getting these fundings and come up with a better solution. Uh, one of the ideas that I was thinking of is that you could um, increase the tax or tax um, the cannabis industry in order to get the funding for the roads or pipes. Uh, one of the pipe things about regional is that there is a regional infrastructure going on because the pipes, lead pipes, um, have been there so long that a lot of them are cracking and they are, are, are you know, in bad repair. And that um, cities, it takes them a lot of money to fix those pipes. 
but you definitely don't want it to get out of hand because we don't want anything like the Flint crisis. I know at the school where I work, we still cannot drink out of a water fountain. We have uh, water containers and things that's in the schools that we have to get our uh, water from these special little things. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Francis, same question. Um, two different infrastructure. One, I the regional solution is we're getting money right now from the federal government through Biden's infrastructure bill and 11 has gotten the money to be allocated to fix the sewer systems. So it's going to be working and making sure that money is actually spent on fixing it. Secondly, we need, there's a funding mechanism in Lansing that allocates funding for roads by the mile, not by the width. So up north and in rural areas get more money for two, the same amount of money for a two lane road as we do for a four lane road. We need to appeal, repeal that law and make sure we get adequate um, revenue sharing to fix the roads in Metro Detroit, where we actually pay the majority of taxes that go to Lansing. So bring the money. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, for our last two specific questions, I needed you to know that I had to do a little rebalancing when one of our candidates did not appear. So our last two questions will be asked answered by six of you. And that is deliberate. Okay, I just wanted you to know that. All right, another um, question related to infrastructure. And this one, we will start with Ms. Pies. Could you identify some projects in our 11th district that would benefit from public funding? If so, could you share two examples? What actions will you take to obtain support for the needed funding? Well, there's some very distinct issues here that, that a lot of cities don't have. St. Clair Shores has uh, seawall concerns mm -hmm. as well as their uh, watershed going into the lake, some pollution there, as well as their uh, hard infrastructure below the city. Um, in 1980s, I believe they had uh, berms put in. And my understanding is that as uh, residents have moved in over the years, they've done away with the berms. Uh, so that's something we need to look at also is um, planting there, if you will. I also believe that we can look at low impact uh, development um, because that affects our infrastructure also. So I think those two things are uh, more quickly approachable, if you will, as I'm really big on zoning laws. So I think we really need to look at the zoning, the low impact and some ecologically responsible um, infrastructure. Thank you. Mr. Wright, could you identify some projects in our district that would benefit from public funding and two examples would be useful? Thank you. Sure. So obviously uh, making sure that every time there's a heavy rain, uh, it doesn't flood around here. Uh, that's a major issue, uh, as some of my uh, colleagues have said tonight. Uh, so that's something that I would certainly focus on. And thanks to the money that's going to be coming from the federal government, uh, we may be able to get a head start on some of those investments, but we can't invest and then ignore for another decade or 15 or 20 years uh, just to have the problem repeat itself. So uh, that would be something. Uh, I mean, especially as this district now crosses county line, that is something 94 is the main corridor for this side of town. So uh, that's something that would benefit everyone. And it may not be two projects, but it's one major project that I think everyone will agree uh, is important and we must focus on. Thank you. Ms. Thornton, same question. Well, first of all, I do believe that uh, the zoning laws, I agree uh, with my fellow colleague that the zoning laws can be um, changed. I believe that uh, the zoning laws for the roads in the area, uh, especially as it concerns the off 94, uh, those laws can be looked at more thoroughly. I also believe, I spoke with people in the Detroit uh, area and they were worried about people speeding through the neighborhoods. So the funding for the public, uh, the speed bumps, I definitely think we need uh, more funding for speed bumps in certain areas. I spoke with some grandparents and they were very concerned with 
uh, people flying through the neighborhood and not stopping. They were concerned with their children. So I definitely think that area definitely needs uh, more funding to look at the individual streets and the safety of the children. Thank you. Mr. Manuel, same question. Thank you. Uh, so just a fun piece of trivia for everybody on the call here. The largest wastewater treatment plant in the country, in the country, is located here in Detroit, Southwest Detroit, near Zug Island. That is a terrible design for a regional water system. That means that sewage from Northern Oakland, from Auburn Hills, has to commute all the way down to Southwest Detroit to be treated and then put back into the, the earth as effluent water. If I had a wish list, I would say we would have more water treatment centers that aren't located in Southwest Detroit. To alleviate the problem of flooding, we must alleviate these pipes and we need more treatment centers around our region to do that. No one's talked about how to pay for any of this. I'm talking about public power. I'm talking about DTE owning public infrastructure and I don't think that's right. The state of Nebraska has a 100% public owned utility grid and generating capacity. They own their own power. I think if we did that here, we would have millions and potentially billions of money, uh, more money for infrastructure spend, excuse me, spending. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manuel. Mr. Cotton, same question. Um, I believe home ownership is really um, the basis for any community. I believe public dollars can be used better with um, promoting more home ownership and as well as um, people who already own their homes to keep them up. One thing about this district is it's one of the most beautiful districts um, in Michigan. Um, you know, there's very small areas that um, look like it can really use some work to be brought up to the standard of the rest of the district, um, as well as I believe um, social workers and social work uh, money for that should be put more into the school system. Um, our children are our future. And if we don't tackle the problem and the issues that our children face right there, they become adults with problems. And when I came home from prison after my wrongful conviction, that's one of the first thing that hit me is the dilapidation of homes and the conditions that our children was in. Thank you. Ms. Williams, same question. Can you identify some projects that would benefit from public funding or share a couple of examples? Um, yes, I think some projects that could benefit from public funding um, definitely is our education system. Um, you know, it, it should be funded in a more equitable basis. Uh, rather than on the peer pupil basis, I think that's doing right now. But also for infrastructure, um, I agree about the flooding um, because it, 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 you know it, that there should be something put in place so that in case anything else like that happens again, that you know the flooding won't won't be like it was because that that was across almost everywhere. And if there was more pumping stations, that would help. And I used to work for the wastewater treatment plant. And you are correct, it is one of the largest in the country. And that's why we also have the most freshest clean water in the country too. But uh, so, you know, um, doing something about the um, um, pumping stations might help. Or there are, I'm sure there could be other things that put in place Thank that could help. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams. All right, Mr. Francis, you will begin our last question, which is on governance. In your view, how has hyperpartisanship affected our elections? How might this affect how you work with the opposite party? And what will you do to accomplish the legislation you want? Well, hyperpartisanship has really hurt America. It's hurt, hurt Michigan. <clears throat> it's caused one side to vilify the other side. It's no longer about policy. It's the other side is anti-American, is anti-democratic. Um, it's really hurt us as a country. We no longer are able to discuss ideas with people and focus on solutions. We're always trying to place the blame. How would I work to fix this? I think you do need to speak to the other side. I think you need to find common issues you can agree on. Once you agree on a common issue, you can work to get a solution. You see this currently with some of the gun control issues that were passed in Congress. When, when you have 70% of your population agreeing on something, 
you should be able to work rationally to get something solved. So I think it's always staying positive, staying on message, don't dive down into personal partisan attacks. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Pai, same question. Could you repeat the question for sure. me, please? In your view, how has hyperpartisanship affected our elections? And how might this affect how you work with those of the opposite party? What will you do to accomplish the legislation you want? Thank you. Well, it, it's pretty much got us all at a standstill and it has us uh, all very afraid of each other uh, for what's happening now. And um, I believe it's uh, affecting many people uh, being hesitant on how to move forward. I believe we just need to go in there and do what we're going to do and try to build alliances along the way, try to build relationships along the way. I believe in compromise when I really think it's workable, but I don't believe in compromise just across the board. So actually I believe that there would be times where um, I wouldn't compromise for this district because I think, I think uh, that's a pretty strong thing to, to just not give in easy to work to work in the best interests of, of our people here in this district, which isn't always compromised, but it's alliances and relationships when we can. Thank you. Mr. White, same question. Uh, so I feel like this question was tailored specifically for me. Uh, thanks to my experience of working in Lansing, having those relationships already established, uh, it'll be easier. Uh, typically, you know, because of the term limits that we have in the state, you spend your first two years uh, getting to know where the bathrooms are and getting to know where your committee rooms are. Uh, but because I've worked with some of the staffers who are there still and some of the elected officials who are on staff and I was on staff now, um, I'll be able to go up there and really get things done. Now, does that mean that 100% of the time that we're going to agree with people on the other side of the aisle? Absolutely not. Uh, but there are issues that overlap with our communities and their communities where we can get things done and be bipartisan and really accomplish the issues that need to be solved for the working families and individuals in this district. So, you know, I'm ready. Uh, I just got to get there, essentially, uh, to, to get things done. Uh, and that's what I'm hoping happens August 2nd. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Same question. I believe that it has caused us to be very stagnant. Basically, nothing's getting done. Um, the first issues that I would tackle are the economics and then the socioeconomic issues. There are issues that we all agree on. That's um, the a price of gas. That's jobs in the neighborhood. So first I would uh, tackle those issues and then I will tackle the infrastructure. Everyone agrees that there's a problem with our infrastructure in the area. Um, funding for schools, mostly everyone that I've spoken to uh, would like schools all across the board to receive funding, uh, educational public schools to receive funding. Everyone is entitled to a good public school system and a good education. So first of all, I will tackle um, economics uh, as far as jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Manuel, same question. Thank you. Yeah, this is a real uh, pertinent issue. And we've been knocking a lot of doors in my campaign on both sides of Eight Mile in this district. And I have had uh, some enlightening conversations with people who seem uh, totally rational until it comes to uh, election fraud and lies that have been proven wrong over and over again. And so I say to the call that I'm not afraid of these people, of standing right in front of them on their front porch and telling them, no, we got that right. You were lied to. And I think that that's going to have to be said over and over and over again in the next two years, relentlessly. I'm ready to do that. Uh, I'm trying to accomplish something that will hit people's bottom lines. Uh, trying, I can't do anything about gas prices. State reps can't do much about food. We can do something about their DTE energy bill. I don't think it takes relationships with staffers in Lansing to be able to do that. I think it takes courage to be able to stand up to a corporate death star that uh, owns our infrastructure. And I'm willing to do that and am doing it currently. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cotton. Same question. 
Thank you. I feel like this question was tailored specifically for me. Um, due to my advocacy work that I do, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of politicians, both Democrat and Republican. And I believe that the way that people interact with you, it starts with you personally, but politics have nothing to do with me. I can't make it about me and I can't make it about the person on the other side of the aisle. It's always about the people. And when you lose sight of that, then you're gonna always make mistakes and say things that make the relationships even worse. Um, I don't have a political mother, I don't have a political father. Um, so I'm stepping into this thing new. I'm not a politician, but I'm coming in with my eyes wide open and I understand that it's always about the people, always. So if that, by using that, I'm able to see the issues without taking one side or the other, because it's not about me. It's not about party. Although party is important, but our system was set up a certain way for a reason. It's set up for us to negotiate. And that's what I plan on doing. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. All right. We have, each of you has had the chance to answer six of the eight questions that were presented. Our last question of the evening allows you to choose from the questions you didn't get a chance to answer. Which one would you like? And we will continue in the same order. So in this case, Ms. Williams, what one question that was posed to the others, would you like the opportunity to, an to answer? Um, I would like to ask the question about Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. um, Roe versus Wade, um, I, I mean, when that ruling came down, it, it was powerful. Um, I've been in a situation in the past, a life-threatening situation in the past, in which I was given a choice. So I had to make the choice that would be best for me in the years to come and what I could live with. And the fact, then I think about that if, 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 if I didn't, wasn't given that choice, the doctors would have done whatever they wanted to do, you know, and I would have had no say so. So I'm a very pro-choice. I believe that, you know, it comes down to a woman and her health care, health care provider. The government should have nothing to do with that because this is about women's health. And this is about being safe. And this is about what's best for you in that moment. It may be different for each woman. Uh, if someone don't believe in abortion, that's fine. They don't have to get an abortion. If they do feel that's right for them at that time, then they should be able to have that choice. So I'm very pro-choice. Thank you very much. Mr. Francis, what is the one question would you like the opportunity to answer? Um, uh, gun control. Mm -hmm. And the, it, everybody talked about different things. They talked about banning assault weapons. And that really isn't a realistic stance because it wouldn't pass. Um, the, there are things that the Republicans agree upon and the Democrats agree upon. 70% of our population agree, agree upon expanding background checks, make sure there's no gun show loophole, uh, red flag laws. So if you're convicted of assault, uh, convicted or accused of domestic violence, you still don't have your guns. The police can go to court and it's like a protection order. They can remove your guns from your house. If you're suicidal, they can remove your guns from your house to, pr to protect you from yourself and to protect society from you with the guns. Also, I propose banning assault weapon sales to anyone under the age of 21. This is something that would pass and it's, this needs the right leadership up there to, to address it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Pies, which question? Gun laws, please. Yes. Um, when I was a teen, uh, I was walking home late one night from a basketball game. Well, not late, about eight or 8.30. Um, a guy pulled up in a truck and told me to get in his truck or he would uh, blow my head to kingdom come. Um, I didn't get in the truck. I still have my head, but it's made me concerned, uh, not just about gun laws, but about things related to safety and guns. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we saw that something did not pass in the house, which was just gun locks. So I would like to, uh, I propose actually, uh, prohibiting firearm sales to people who have been charged with domestic violence or convict, convicted of violent misdemeanors. I prefer, um, I would propose rather requiring unlicensed firearms dealers to abide by the same laws as licensed retailers for rifle purchases. And I would also encourage the smart gun technology, which disables 
a firearm if anyone other than the registered owner or an authorized user attempts to use it. Outside of that, for safety. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. White. I'll take the uh, what motivated you to run uh, for mm -hmm. this office question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I thought about, when I was having these conversations about running, um, it became very clear to me that the district needs someone uh, who can lead, who can go to Lansing to lead. Uh, and it became clear that uh, I had those qualifications to do that. Uh, and like most of the people on this call, you know, I'm a lifelong uh, resident here. Uh, you know, I think that that is important because you are able to understand the issues uh, that are affecting the community and how to go up there and tackle them. So what motivated me to run uh, was the need for someone to tackle these issues and introduce meaningful legislation uh, and get things done and have those relationships to do it because that's the only way that you're able to get it, get it done. Uh, so that's uh, really what, what motivated me to want to run. Uh, and, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you. Ms. Thornton, which question would you like to answer? What motivated me to run? Um, I didn't get a chance to answer that question, but what motivated me to run is my public service experience. Um, during this time, I've worked for the justice system for 30 years. And just seeing the discrepancies, not only in the justice system, but with um, the economic issues that transpired to the justice system. And having uh, lived in this district for over 30 years, speaking with people in the district, um, businesses, they want public safety. Uh, people want their children to be able to be educated. People can't afford to send their children to private schools. So public funding for education uh, made me say, okay, I went to a public school, my children went to a public school, and everyone is entitled to a good education, and everyone is entitled to clean water. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Manuel, which question, please? I would like to revisit the economic or social issue question. Mm -hmm. question. Uh, are really tight on money right now. And these are people, it, it, a lot of the people in the district that I've spoken with, I've had so many examples where people say, they give me their numbers. I have a background in accounting. And so I ask, their income could be $800 a month and 200 of that goes to a water bill and another 200 in the winter or higher goes to heating their home. And because we have a corporate giant that manages our public infrastructure, they don't invest in low income areas. And so the people I'm talking with going door to door tell me about their power outages that may only last a day or two, but it ruins all the food in their fridge. There's 300 more dollars and that's a monthly budget for them. And as I go through this process, I get more and more emboldened by how deep the pockets of corporate interests that own public infrastructure are and the juxtaposition between real working people that are $200 out because their food is all spoiled. Thank you. Economic issues are where I'll focus. Thank you. Mr. Cotton, which question would you like to answer? Uh, Roe versus Wade. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, this, is, this is very important to me um, because I know that um, if we don't do something about it, um, this is going to lead to a lot of wrongful convictions. We're going to have a lot of women prosecuted and persecuted um, because they just really want to exercise the right over their own body. Um, unfortunately, we've been kind of slow to act. Uh, we've been waiting for the U.S. Supreme Court, this whole thing to play out. Now it has played out and we have a 1931 law in the books. Um, and that's like a, a sword over uh, women all over this state um, head. Um, if they make a decision that they believe is best for them, they may very well um, be wrongfully convicted, you know, and, and most of Americans and, and most of Michiganders um, um, know this, believe this, so they're going to expect their legislators to get in there and get this done. Um, it's long overdue. Uh, we need to have care over criminalization. Uh, we cannot criminalize our women for wanting to have and exercise the right over their own bodies. Thank you, thank you. We now turn to the candidates' closing statements. 
Now those closing statements will not exceed two minutes and the order of presentation is reversed from the opening statements. So we will begin with Mr. Manuel. Thank you. Uh, four months ago, I was just a guy with a job working from this desk that you see behind me. And I have gone through this process campaigning uh, originally focused on infrastructure and over time with, with the repeal of Roe and with school shootings and with inflation, gas prices hitting $5 a gallon. This has become about so much more for me than just infrastructure. And it's been a privilege getting to know the people of the 11th district as we've gone and met them. Um, I guess I just wanna close in saying the gravity of this moment is not lost upon me. And I guess uh, I, I say that specifically to the League of Women, Women Voters this week. Um, it, 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 they, it, it was a punch in the gut for everybody this week, this Roe v. Wade overturn. And I, I guess I just wanna underscore that even though I'm new to politics, um, I've, I've been a professional for over 10 years and I, I'm tough as nails and I'm ready to go fight and do things differently in Lansing. And I'm really tired of, and the people I've spoken with going door to door loyal Democrats. And I know that because we can see in the voter file how if they voted every election, this is the first time they're saying, I don't even know why I vote. And they're disappointed in the leadership that has been in charge in their lifetime. And the people that pay their taxes on time and they do things right and the basement floods and no one shows up to help them. And so I'm doing this for them. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thornton, your closing statement. As I stated previously, I not only am a public servant, I am a fighter. I fought to make sure that our union members um, receive fair wages. I fought to make sure that they receive benefits. Back in 2007, when Obama was uh, just starting to run. I was in a district much like St. Clair Shores. Um, I was one of a few minorities in Plymouth, but I saw the need and how it would make a difference to go out, make sure that people are registered to vote. Um, people can make a difference. Now I see people wanting to give up. So I got in this race because I wanna make sure that people continue to fight. Um, we can make a difference. We can make a difference with role. We can make a difference with education. We can make a difference with infrastructure. Uh, as long as we make sure that people vote, as long as we make sure that um, we're not leaving anyone by the wayside in our criminal justice system, as long as we make sure that our business does. Um, I spoke with someone today and he was so frustrated about the safety in the business. His, um, he said that no one's helping him. And I still believe that we need public safety. We need um, to invest in public safety also. We need to make sure that organizations uh, can help in the um, district, that organizations, public organizations can help in the district. And I just believe that if we don't give up, if we continue to fight, I've never given up. I've always, and I tell my children, don't give up no matter what. Um, I'm in this race and I'm going to keep making sure that people are ready to vote and thank you. And thank you, Mr. White. Well, thanks again, Sue, and thank you to the league for hosting us tonight. Um, it's a pleasure to talk about the issues that are important to our community and. Uh, just really being a good space with fellow Democrats. Uh, so, you know, I'm running for this office uh, because we need serious governing uh, up in Lansing and we need people who are serious about it up in Lansing. Uh, you know, I'm not doing this as some vanity project. I don't, you know, necessarily like seeing my name on the ballot, but, uh, you know, I know that's necessary to get up there and really accomplish some big issues. Uh, and as we have this new district uh, that goes from Detroit and the Harper Woods and St. Clair Shores, uh, we need people who can seriously go up there introduce legislation, get it passed and benefit our communities. Uh, and I get it, this may not always be a state level issue, but that's why it takes people who understand that you can work at the federal level, at the local level, at the county level, and um, with the private sector 
to really solve these problems because that is all that this is about. It's about solving the problem. So, you know, again, I ask for the votes of everyone who will watch this later on August 2nd. Uh, and I look forward to getting to Lansing and to leading uh, and to being a good state representative. So thank you again. Thank you. Ms. Pies. Um, thank you again for inviting me to be part of this tonight. Um, I believe that being in government should be more about uh, what you know and rather than who you know in government. I believe that I, I know our community pretty well. I've been a council member here for seven years, involved in my community for a good 15 years. I've worked for a civil rights organization, Focus Hope, I volunteer uh, regularly at our community food bank. And, and I think over the years, I've had great opportunities to work with our residents here and to help them solve problems and they help me solve problems as well. So I really believe that I've got a, a good understanding, if you will, of the issues that are important, not just to the residents in this city, but to our neighboring cities as well. Um, I, I believe that I've got a, got a good track record about that also. Um, I know that, that right now in our government, we need representation. And I believe we need that uh, by a woman. I think as a Latina, we need more Hispanic representation in our government to get a more diverse take and uh, legislative um, opportunity, if you will. Um, so I believe that I've got the knowledge and the experience and, and proven leadership. And I think I've got the track record of working with our residents and being able to have good relationships with everyone. I think I can take all of that plus my knowledge through the Michigan Municipal League of working on their legislative committees and seeing pending and proposed legislation, I think I can take all of that. I know I can take all of that and take it to the state legislature and work for what's good for the people in this district first and throughout the state um, at the same time, but with a focus on this district as well. So I'm asking people to vote for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Francis, your closing statement. First, I'd like to thank everyone for putting it together and also my fellow candidates for being here today. It's been a pleasure to put faces to name and hear, hear everybody and their uh, opinions on different issues. Um, as you can see, anyone that's watching the video or gonna watch the video in the future, we all have very similar opinions. So when it comes to voting, I know that I'm the best candidate because I believe I have uh, the ability to work with people from other parties. Also, I bring a, uh, a fresh take on what needs to be done. I've been in the private sector longer than I like to admit for over 30 years. I've worked with the majority of people who are from different political views in mind. And then anytime you deal with someone, if you put down common issues, you can find common ground. I think that I have a, uh, a plan for all the major issues, just not one issue. You need to raise the minimum wage. You need to focus on women's health care, support skilled trades. We need to make sure we have skilled trades in our high school. We also need to repeal the tax on senior pensions. This is something that's unconscionable that we raise the tax on pensions, that we need to get rid of that across the board. We need common sense gun laws, but we need gun laws that'll pass. We also need to fix our sewer system. Um, that's something that we do have the money coming from Biden's infrastructure plan, but we need to make sure it's put in place. So I ask everybody to vote for me on August 2nd. Make sure you get out and vote. And I will look forward to servicing you, uh, service, servicing the, 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 the residents of the 11th districts. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Ms. Williams, your closing statement. Ms. Williams, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, first I would like to thank the League of Women Voters and everyone for coming out today. Um, as a candidate for state representative, you have now heard from several other candidates. I must select the one that you believe best represents you. I'm an educated person who possess strong leadership skills. I'm an African-American woman and, I'm a, I, and I am a committed city councilwoman. 
former Board of Education trustee, former military officer, and a dedicated mathematics teacher. I am an experienced city leader who have worked hard and have earned the trust from the people of the community. If I'm elected as your new state representative, I will work tirelessly to help enact policies to decrease gun violence, support women's reproductive rights, and fix the infrastructure, along with providing equity in our education system. So do not vote for someone just because an organization tells you to do so, or because an endorsement by someone famous, but for whom you believe have your best interests at heart. Vote for the person who best represents you, who have been where you are and understands the needs of the community. I know that I am that person. I have represented you for the past 10 years as a trusted elected, trusted elected official and 26 years as a highly effective educator. I will fight for you. I ask that you continue to believe in me and trust in my leadership. So can you do that for me? I work hard as your state representative for District 11. So vote for me, Regina Williams on August 2nd. I look forward to your vote. Together, we will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cotton. Thank you. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters uh, for putting this beautiful thing together um, and as well as the other candidates for being here. But most importantly, I'd like to thank um, the voters uh, for tuning in because if you're watching this, that means you really, really care. Um, and I appreciate that. I'm an optimistic um, at heart. You know, I inherently believe that um, all people are good, um, but they just need the right environment for that to come out. Now, I know that sounds kind of strange coming from somebody that's been wronged um, the way that I have, you know, spending nearly 20 years in prison for a crime that I didn't commit. Um, but I am. I'm an optimist. Um, I believe that things can be a lot better than they are. Um, I believe that our experience um, politicians and our experienced people that have worked for politicians and our experienced people that have uh, done all of these things is a part of the problem because they have the experience to continue um, the things that we are experiencing. Um, I like to do something a little different, not anything radical, but I like to just show you who I am, that I don't bend, I don't break. Um, I do compromise with great ideas. Um, and I believe that I'm made for this time right here to be a vessel for the voters. Um, I really want to um, um, show you what transparency look like, show you what being held accountable look like. And I like to empower the people if the people will empower me with their vote. Thank you. Thank you. The League of Women Voters wishes to thank the candidates, the forum officials, and all of you for participating. If the audience still has questions for the candidates, we encourage them to contact the candidates directly. And now I'd like to turn the forum back to Rhonda Craig, the president of the League of Women Voters, Detroit. Thank you, Sue. And thank you especially to tonight's participants for their commitment to public service in our community. A link to this forum will be available on the Detroit League's website and YouTube, Macomb League's website, Facebook, and YouTube, and on the Gross Point League's Facebook website and YouTube prior to the primary. The candidates have also answered questions about their candidacy on vote411.org. The on online Vote411 voter guide covers this and other races, giving you a comprehensive picture of the people running on your own ballot. You can access Vote 411 on vote411.org or the Gross Point League of Women Voters website. Election day is Tuesday, August 2nd. Polls will open at 7 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. Michigan offers voting by absentee ballot for any reason. You can register, verify your voting registration status, or request an absentee ballot by calling your city clerk going to vote411.org or accessing the Secretary of State website. We strongly encourage you to vote early by absentee ballot and return your ballot well before election day. If you mail your ballot, allow two weeks for it to reach your city clerk. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>